The government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. In April 1982, Britain sent nearly 30,000 young soldiers, sailors and air crew 8,000 miles to the South Atlantic to reclaim the Falkland Islands after they were invaded by Argentina. One victory would transform the nation. I think the Falklands War was an extraordinary military achievement. We came back after that war to a different sort of Britain. But success wasn't guaranteed. Speaking publicly for the first time, the then commanding officer of the SAS reveals how close the task force came to defeat. They say it was down to 10 minutes that we might well have lost the war. Commanders and ground troops talk candidly, shedding new light on flaws in the operation. The whole command chain was utterly dysfunctional. Some claim that Goose Green, the most famous battle in the war, need never have been fought, and was a waste of lives and resources. The orders to attack and capture Goose Green. I mean, I thought it was a stupid thing to do. Lieutenant Colonel Jones, Captain how a sudden change in the plan for the land campaign nearly lost Britain the war. They were sitting ducks. It was completely unnecessary and sadly cost 200 casualties. The truth certainly needs to be told about some of the things that went wrong. I mean, how did it happen? With recordings of the negotiations to end the conflict uncovered for the first time. He is prepared to consider surrender and secret satellite communications from a British undercover mission in Chile. Without this information, we would have lost the war. Forty years on, the Falklands War is still giving up its secrets. I was at home and the duty driver knocked at the door. And he says, you've got to get back into camp. I says, why? He says, the Argentinians have invaded the Falklands. And I'm thinking, Falklands, that's got to be a Scotland. Why would they attack Scotland? In 1982, Britain was unprepared to launch a military campaign to reclaim islands 8,000 miles away that few could find on a map. Previous year, we'd just really been hit by the NOT defence review. It was going to take away our carriers, our amphibious ships, possibly even the Royal Marines. And the discussion went along the lines of, we really need a war against somebody, <laughs> just to show the country and the politicians how good we are. If the frantic diplomacy failed, thousands of British troops would need to launch a land campaign on the Falkland Islands to retake them. The task was given to three commando brigade, 3,000 Royal Marines backed up by two battalions of paratroopers. But first the Navy had to transport them to the South Atlantic and land them on the islands. It was the biggest amphibious uh, logistical challenge since D-Day. It was scary. And time was short. It would take at least seven weeks to get a naval task force to the remote islands. And the South Atlantic winter was less than 75 days away. We knew that this was all going to happen 8,000 miles from home, which is an awful long way. We knew that the weather was liable to be dreadful. In wars, things have a ghastly habit of going horribly wrong. In 1982, Michael Rose commanded Britain's elite Special Forces Regiment 22 SAS. He's speaking publicly for the first time about the Falklands War. After 40 years, it's time a full story was told. In 1980, just two years earlier, the SAS had become national heroes when they ended the Iranian embassy siege but some at the top seemed reluctant to use them in the new crisis. After a couple of days of not hearing from anyone, it became apparent that the Royal Navy had never heard of the Special Air Service and that we were not on the order of battle. 
we, we had to do what we normally do, is, is make our own way. I telephoned Julian Thompson. Mike Rose, who I knew from Northern Ireland days, uh, rang me up and said, do you want us? I said, right, well, come on, join the party. 100 SAS would now join the task force on the journey south. With their naval counterparts in the special boat service, they would be inserted behind enemy lines to prepare for the main landings. It wouldn't all be plain sailing. We were badly equipped. We hadn't got enough of many things that we could expect to have going to war. And it was all, what's the expression? A lash up. That's a naval expression. A very British lash up was about to be complicated further. Overall command of the task force was assigned to the Royal Navy, working from its headquarters in a bunker deep under Northwood in Middlesex. Now the trouble with Northwood was that they were accustomed to harassing Russian submarines. Now you can do that very happily by radio, sitting in a bunker in Middlesex. But trying to run an amphibious operation 8,000 miles away is a totally different ball game. It was a good decision that the Royal Navy should be in the lead. But what Northwood didn't do uh, was turn itself into an integrated joint headquarters. It had no military or air force input. It was inevitable that it was going to be a command and control model from the start. Admiral John Fieldhouse would oversee operations from the Middlesex bunker. But instead of appointing a single commander in the field, the Navy appointed three. Royal Marine Brigadier Julian Thompson was in charge of the land force comprising three commando brigade. Admiral Sandy Woodward commanded the naval task force and Commodore Michael Clapp directed the amphibious landings. The whole command chain was utterly dysfunctional. Throughout, there was this feeling of Who's in charge of this bit? You were never sure at any one point who was driving bits of the campaign. We very nearly lost the war because of some extraordinarily bad decisions that were taken by Northwood with regards to the land battle. There was one other choice that would have a profound effect on the campaign. In three commando brigades wake would come a second force, five infantry brigade to provide reinforcements after the landings. It was made up of a battalion each from the Welsh and Scots Guards and the Gurkhas. In April, it was put through its paces by its commander, Brigadier Tony Wilson, on a training exercise in Wales. So I thought I'd better go and have a look at this lot. And my first impression was, God, what a bloody shambles this lot is. Surely they're not thinking of sending them abroad to fight a real war. We were sitting in Brecon Beacons and the brigade commander appeared and said, we're going to do a brigade attack tonight and I want you to make the plan. And we thought, hang on, he should be giving us the plan. Brigadier Tony Wilson had come out as so indecisive and so incompetent in Wales that they decided that he should be removed from his command. General Bramall, who was the Chief of Defence, overruled that decision because he thought it would be bad for the morale of the brigade to have its brigadier removed. Bramall told me that it was the worst decision he'd taken in 45 years of soldiery, and it was. I would have sacked um, brigade commander then and there, just on the evidence I saw in this test exercise, let alone what he got up to when he got to the Falklands. When we sailed from Southampton, suddenly everybody's waving the Union Jack again, and suddenly all the jingoism, it's all back. It's back to Kipling and standing there on the quayside waving the flags um, to go off and, and fight Johnny Foreigner somewhere on the other side of the world. On board were the men who would launch the initial landing, the Marines and paratroopers of 3 Commando Brigade. My name is Sue Lilaji. During the Falklands War, I was private soldier in three para. 
I thought, when they hear that we're going to come, they're just going to say, let's go home. But when this ship blew its horn and we started to sail, I thought, hang on, I'm probably not going to come back. In fact, I was convinced I was going to die. For years, the army had been mired in the Northern Ireland Troubles. The crisis gave them a chance to fight a more conventional war against an enemy in uniform. All the way down, we kept getting little news snippets of what the politicians were trying to do and head off this, this, this war. We were hoping the politicians weren't successful. We were all sort of anxious to, come on, let's get down there and get on with it. You know, when I look back now, I think it was great, you know. <laughs> As the task force headed south, the SAS made a secret deal with US Special Forces friends to ensure they were equipped with the latest high-tech kit. Before leaving England, um, I got a call from uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Burroughs, known to everybody as Bucky Burroughs, uh, who was the chief executive officer of Delta Force. He said, uh, Michael, you're going to need some things I've got here. I said, what are those, Bucky? He said, you're going to need portable tactical satellites. I said, yeah, I've seen you demonstrate. They would be incredibly useful for us. He said, I'm going to send you eight or nine of those. The new satellite phones allowed Michael Rose to talk to his commanders in the field and the headquarters in Northwood back in the UK using an American satellite channel. What the Americans did was allow us to use that segment of the satellite. The day the war ended, the satellite was switched off. With the British Army still tapping out some of their battlefield communications in Morse code, portable satellite telephones gave the SAS an invaluable advantage. Tactical satellites we had been lent by Bucky Barrett was a personal loan to me. It was great pressure for me to hand two of them over to the MOD, and I absolutely refused to allow that. They had their naval communications, and I was not going to let them interrupt my own communications. <laughs> The British were already facing an enormous challenge. The Argentinians had complete control of the islands. When we arrived on the island, I felt very emotional and blessed to be able to defend my country. The whole Argentina population supported the recuperation. It's a very strong sentiment of sovereignty, and the islands are part of our houses. Sentir un lugar familiar, un lugar al que, al que quiero y un lugar donde estuve dispuesto a dejar mi vida. Y lo volvería a hacer. For Argentina, the war was a diversion from a vicious internal conflict. John Shakespeare, my name. I was at the British Embassy in Buenos Aires. My name is Nicholas Shakespeare. I was in Argentina as an adolescent. The Argentine military dictatorship were getting more and more brutal. The military persecution of the young and of anybody left wing was going on. I mean, we now know that 30,000 people up, upwards were killed. I think the armed forces felt very contaminated by what they had done to their population. And I think they sought an external adventure that would kind of purify them. Britain was also shaken by its own upheavals. It's very hard to recapture the sense of failure that hung over Britain in the late 70s and early 1980s. We couldn't make cars that anybody wanted to buy. Um, we couldn't make a washing machine that was likely to work to the end of its guarantee. It was politically a very divided time. There were riots in many British cities in the summer of 1981. Polls showed that Margaret Thatcher was the least popular Prime Minister since 1945. Going to war was a high-risk gamble for Mrs. Thatcher. So an early success was essential. The first objective was the recapture of South Georgia, 800 miles east of the Falklands and part of its territory. South Georgia was absolutely vital to be taken quickly because it signaled that we meant business. 